welcome, welcome to the Board of Education Candidates Forum. So thank you for coming out this evening and being interested in uh, education. There are three slates of candidates running in this election. One slate has two candidates, and the two others have three candidates each. There are, therefore, eight candidates. Originally, there was something like 12, and then a number of people withdrew and withdrew and withdrew, and all of this was going on even up until last week. So everything has been sort of pressed into the last couple of weeks. Of these three slates that are now um, running, only two are here this evening. The third slate was unable to get its candidates to come here. We only found out yesterday morning that one of the last candidates on their slate was going to be out of town, uh, which is the first time I knew that. So um, we were a little shocked because we understood then we were not going to have three candidates here. And um, so we're sorry about that. We're dismayed about it because this is the first time in seven years that we have not been able to have full slates represented in these forums. Our moderator. Many of you know him very well. He has moderated the majority of our forums over the last six years. This is his seventh year doing it, and we've been very, very privileged to have him as our moderator. He makes these, these events a success. He's a documentary filmmaker, and he's the head of an organization called Choice Media. It's a national education news group which publishes a daily newswire, a website, and has a Twitter feed. The tweets can be followed on <laughs> at <laughs> Choice Media TV. His latest film is called The Ticket, and it's about seven school choice innovations happening across seven states. It recently won the coveted Audience Choice Award at the Anthem Film Festival in Las Vegas in July. And it is once again my great pleasure to introduce Bob Bowden. Thank you, Helen. So, I wanted to tell the folks here that I you know, haven't done this for a while, I've now perfected my random number generator speaker ordering system. I used to do it on, on index cards, but can you all see my screen? Well, I'm going to push it there. Can you try to see it? I, I'll read out the order anyway. The point is, is, so if you see on the right side, I have these random numbers, and all I'm going to do each time is when I hit this refresh button, and I'll do it a bunch of times right now, you see it reorders the five people in random orders each time. So I can just kind of keep hitting that each time, and it'll be a different order as we go. So I, and I, I can read out the order as we proceed. And so anyway, so the, the um, structure tonight, I'm told, is it will be one minute opening statements will be first. And by convention and tradition, we allow applause after opening statements. And uh, so that's where we'll start. And so I will hit refresh one more time. That will give us the order of opening statements. Boom. And the order, by the way, is Mr. Murphy, Mr. Biancamano, Ms. Waiters, Ms. Road Kearns, and Ms. Danziger. That's the. Excuse me. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes. And the timekeeper. <laughs> Uh, the, I think we agreed that after 45 <laughs> seconds of your one minute time, you'll get the yellow signal just like you're at a traffic light when you normally hit the gas and try to sneak <laughs> through the yellow. And then when you're out, it, when the, out of time, it'll be the red uh, folder. Uh, and then if you just, if you can finish your sentence, if you get the red folder, uh, you don't have to stop in the middle of a sentence. But that's, that's the convention by which we'll operate in that regard. So now we'll now begin with opening statements, and again, applause is acceptable, and we will begin with Mr. Murray. I'm Brian Murray, proud father of Wallace fifth grader Jackson and third grader Melanie. Together with my awesome wife, Bonnie, we have been and continue to be 
proud supporters of our public schools. As a real estate professional, I've seen too many families and friends head to the suburbs. This needs to change. We must demand from the BOE a school system where families stay for the schools, not leave because of them. We have students with much untapped potential and great teachers to guide them, like Ms. Miller at the high school and Ms. Schickman at Wallace. But we must change by stopping the revolving door of superintendents and administrators, which severely hurts our test scores. We must change by being responsible with our budget. Most importantly, we must change by having the BOE become a place where all parent concerns are heard and appreciated. A change that would have the BOE not illegally fire kindergarten aides or fire the bus aides of special needs students. That's why I'm excited to be part of Parents for Change. One plus six equals seven. Mr. Biancomano. Thank you, and I would first like to thank Helen Minogue and the Quality of Life Coalition volunteers, as well as the Elks Lodge, and of course Mr. Bowden uh, for another great year uh, in uh, moderating this important forum. Ralph Emerson once said, the secret in education lies in respecting the students. Tonight we are going to discuss a wide range of topics and issues affecting our city's education system. There is no easy solution to the litany of challenges facing our district. Our ultimate responsibility is the education of our students. The respect we show this evening should model the respect for our students. I have learned during my time as a board member the last three years that no singular member of the nine member board could enact change. It takes an ability to work with other board members even when we hold opposing views. I keep in mind that ultimately, our common aim is the improvement, the improvement of our public schools, even if we differ strongly about the ways to achieve that result. I look forward tonight to discussing those issues. Thank you so much. Ms. Waiters. Good evening. Aren't you glad I made it? For all the ones that think I wasn't coming tonight, I'm here. Okay, with all con uh, the, the confusion and since this election that's been going toward me, I'm gonna try tonight really hard not to lose focus. My motive and my objective for continuing to work with the Board of Ed, you all know I ran for five years and wasn't successful, but I stayed involved and I will continue to stay involved to make changes for all the schools, the charter, OLA, Alige, anybody need our help, I'm there. It's about policy and it's a business and it's about our children. So when I get elected, which I will, I'm gonna bring change to the Board of Education. I'm gonna cut around the chase. I don't have to tell you who I am. You see me on channel 77. I'm solely dependent on that camera tonight. So you will see ding dong, the witch is not dead. Thank you. Ms. Rhodes Kearns. Hi, my name is Frances Rhodes Kearns and I'm seeking re-election for a fifth term on the board. And if I have learned anything in my years on the board, it's that no party who has a simple majority should ever have complete control. I pride myself in being a watchdog for both our students and our taxpayers. I want to put an end to the revolving door caused by kids first and their micromanagement of our administrators. Although Kids First has changed their slogan, make no mistakes about it. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. Kids First miserable record won't go away by a simple name change. I ask for the privilege of continued service to our children. Thank you. And Ms. Danzer. I'm an 18 year resident of Hoboken. I'm married and I have a fourth grader in the Hoboken Dual Immersion Language School. For 17 years I've been a professional executive recruiter helping companies identify, hire, and retain top management to solve issues, build businesses, and lead the companies to success. I have three reasons for running. One is I'm tired of the revolving door of the administration. No ability to set strategy and implement or prosper can come from lack of stability. 
I want my son to be a Red Wing and be able to transition into Hoboken High School with the same level of education excellence that he currently receives. And finally, parents should feel that they have a voice. They should be able to express their opinions and ideas without being chastised because they are not in line with the majority. I am ready to lay the groundwork. We need to build a bridge between the community and the district. All right, so now we'll get to the questions. That I guess you guys know they're index cards. You can write down questions and filter them uh, on over. Um, I'm sorry? We're going to change the order, yes. <laughs> My ceremonial order change. Uh, if I forget, though, I'm sure I will. You guys are running. Uh, so, so it's a one minute response to the questions and then a 30, after all five speak, there is an opportunity for a 30 second rebuttal. If you want to, just kind of let me know and raise your hand and we'll, and I'll just proceed on kind of whoever I see first and we'll go like that. So now with my refresh setting click, there we have it. Not much of a change, but uh, Mr. Murray goes first. And here's the question, uh, by the way, Mr. Murray, then Ms. Waiters, then Mr. Biancomano, then Ms. Rose Curtis, then Ms. Danziger. The question being, the district faces significant budget challenges given decreases in federal aid under underfunding by the state and charter school expansion to name just a few factors. Please explain how you would meet these challenges. Are you prepared to raise taxes? Will you reduce staff and programs? Please give specific examples. Question on the budget, we begin with Mr. Murray. Okay, thanks Bob. Uh, a really simple way to look at the budget is if the budget is represented by $2, uh, all the press that we've heard about the charter schools and the money they're taking away from the expansion of the charter school is represented by this pen. Now, of these $2, only $1 actually goes into the classroom. This is for teachers and pencils and things like that. There is a full dollar of overhead. This is where the budget needs to be focused on. <coughs> Kids First slash Parents for Progress wants you to focus on a penny, where there's a whole dollar here where they've all just uh, approved a prorated $300,000 for the paralegals. So there are lots of ways that we can cut this budget without raising taxes. Thank you. Okay, uh, no applause now, I should have said. This, this part is when we don't. Traditional. I'll applause Ms. Waiters next. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> it's rather long, but it's about the budget right. saying that budget challenges, uh, and so would you want to raise taxes to meet some of them? Would you would you reduce staff or programs to meet budget challenges? Please give specific examples. All right, what I've experienced lately with the budget, and I attend every meeting, I know Ms. Nunn, I'm, I'm the watchdog at the budget. Right now, they, uh, the Kids First ticket have the majority. So what I would work on doing and focusing my attention on is dealing with Trenton on the state level because it's like a no-brainer here. My, my uh, running mate tried to explain to you the figures when it goes down to the dollar, but basically it all starts up to pure politics. They do have the majority. I don't really have a say-so right now, but I will be a voice down in Trenton. Thank you. Okay, next Mr. Biancomano on the budget. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. I think that when we're talking about a $65 million budget, which I have sat at meetings and said that this is a lot of money, I voted against the last two budgets because of the increase in taxes, simply because the vote was taken away from uh, the, the members of the community to vote on what to do with their money. And I don't think that's fair when you're raising taxes. But if we're looking at the budget, we need to look at non-educational spending. Three years ago, I took the audit that we get every year and I looked at what non-educational spending was on there. And I wanted to tackle those issues. I know that I wasn't in a majority, but I still wanted to tackle those issues. One of them was legal fees. We were 153% over the state average in legal fees. I'm glad that, as of this year, that's been lowered to not, oh, not the state average, but getting closer and closer as we move along. Another thing that I looked at was the food services debt. And with the help of my colleagues, even though I wasn't a minority, we have a plan now to eliminate the food services debt in the future. So again, we need to look at non-educational fund uh, spending, and that's where we can cut the budget. Thank you. Ms. Rose Kearns. Okay, I agree in that uh, with Peter, and um, if some people don't realize it, we, are, we do have that 2% cap. However, there are areas in our budget that do not come under that 2% cap. And those areas are debt service, 
capital improvements, health costs, which probably is our biggest uh, cost, insurance and pensions. So these are areas uh, somehow um, maybe we can look at to make cuts there, the health coverage, and that's where I would be looking. And also I would be petitioning the state, our legislators, about funding for the charter schools and get them funded the way that they should be and stop taking it from our budget also. Thank you. Ms. Danziger. 50% of the budget goes to the classroom. <clears throat> the other 50% of it goes to many other things. Um, I, when I become a member of the board, I, I really would like to look into that and find out where we're spending that money and why we're not spending it efficiently. Um, we've raised taxes this year, and yet the enrollment in our schools have not gone up. And we fired kindergarten teachers, uh, kindergarten aides this year because they said in the budget that they didn't have enough money. And when they found out that those kindergarten aides deserve to be there and legally they must be there, somehow or another, the Board of Education found $244,000. So I don't know as much as Fran and Peter because they've been on the board, but what I do know is that I've run a business for 14 years and I know how to manage a budget and I think that we need to look at it more closely and, and be watchful. Okay, we now have time for rebuttals. Ms. Waiters. This rebuttal is for Peter. Um, on the front page here, you said the question was simply, what will we do about the budget? Again, I said I will deal with Trenton. Our rights to vote on the budget was taken away from us. Remember that. So that's when I got even more involved. Right on the front page of the paper, thank God I go to the county meetings too. School board Jersey City Hoboken faces a tax hike on the county and local level. Again, I'm trying to tell you, I'm not going to waste my energy tonight. I'm going to get right down to the punches. I'll work with Trenton, okay, before I be intimidated by the majority. And yes, we can't prevent this without me being on the board. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a two questions. Um, one, as a parent, Fran, you've been on the board for 12 years, and your response was, you know, maybe we can look at some of these areas. Uh, for 12 years, uh, have you been on the, the finance committee? Have you or Peter been on the finance? Are you currently on the finance committee? Uh, have you chaired the finance committee? It just seems like an awful long time that you've been there for you to maybe be coming up with some ideas right now. Go ahead. Oh, she addressed her directly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes, I was on the finance committee last year. That answers your question. And Ms. Waiters, this is exactly why I'm telling you that I didn't vote against the budget because there was an increase, and I wasn't going to vote for a budget that increased taxes when the public did not have a right to vote on what to do with their money. I mean, we just had a property revaluation. Re I'm a property owner. My parents own many properties in town. And the, and the last thing I want to do is raise people's taxes more money than with the property be evaluation out there. And that's exactly why I believe that it should go to public referendum as soon as it's above 2%, because the state says that we can raise it up to 2%. But I believe that it should go to referendum no matter what, 2%, 4%. So I hope that answered your question, Ms. Waiters. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, I was asked to remind the group that uh, we generally prefer questions about policy and what, what should be done about this or that, rather than ad hominem kinds of questions about why are you such a jerk kind of questions. So just a reminder that you know we're more likely to ask a question. They're welcome to say whatever they want, of course, but in terms of the questions, we'd like them to be more sort of about the issues uh, and less personal. Uh, so that said, uh, I will move on to the next question. Actually, I'll hit the refresh now, give you guys advance notice. We'll have Bianca Camano, Danziger, Waiters, Murray, Rhodes Kearns this time. This question being, what are some of your innovative ideas on how to make Hoboken High School better and quite frankly, a more attractive option for Hoboken parents? What are some of your innovative ideas? Mr. Bianca Mano. One innovative idea I have, Bob, and this is regarding the old um, petition slash lawsuit that's coming up. 
what, as everybody knows, if, well, most people know in this room that I did vote against that lawsuit, the $50,000 uh, to fund a, the uh, petition slash lawsuit, because I believe we could take that $50,000 and I believe we could put that in the high school and start creating a dual language program in the high school. I feel that the high school is a school where we have the least amount of, we're having the most enrollment troubles, I should say. Our elementary schools are doing fine right now. And I feel that if you add a program such as a dual language program, and possibly opening up the district, the theater program to a district-wide program, we could market the school better. This way more students can come in. So that's just some of my innovative ideas, and I would hope that everybody would agree with that. Thank you. Ms. Danziger. I think the biggest problem here in Hoboken is perception. Our perception of what is happening in the schools, what is happening in the high schools. And I think many of us have not spent a lot of time in those schools. And I think one of the things that would really bring this community together, because let's face it, that high school has to be the heartbeat, the hub of this community. And the only way that you can do that is to open the doors for everyone. We, at a charter school, wanted to have a field day this past year. We were told by the high school that we were not allowed to use the field. My son performs with a dance company and every year we have used the Hoboken Theater for our Nutcracker performance and our dance performance and we were told this year that we were not allowed to use the theater for the, the local business. So if you want us to be part of that and you want us to join in, you have to make it open to all of us and create programs that all of us can be a part of. Time, uh, Ms. Waiters. Involvement, pure involvement. I'm glad to say I have the proud product of my daughter that's attending the Hoboken High School right now as we speak. Even when she wasn't in the Hoboken High School and attended the Hoboken Charter High School, it all boils down to Segregation. This is an article from the New Jersey Education Association dated for 2014. It's time for equality in Hoboken. Treat that high school with the same respect and resources that you cater to the other schools with and come and get involved. We have to break the stereotype first. My daughter and her classmates was told in the charter school after the eighth grade, look for a school to go to. And that's disheartening. Because look where she's at. She had to wind up going to the high school. So what I do is stay involved. I, I communicate with the students there. Any problems they have, I open up my heart to them. Stay involved and I'm trying to make change to that high school. Thank you. Mr. Murray. Well, for the better part of two years now, I have been advocating that the high school, uh, that we create some, what's called academies, where we have a science and math academy, and a liberal arts academy, and even a vocational academy, where uh, the students can really focus their energies uh, on a specific topic and, and really be able to uh, get a better in-depth education in those particular things, and then the parents can choose those things as well. In fact, you know, uh, going along the arts, uh, the uh, science uh, academy, I've been advocating for a partnership with Stevens, a real partnership with Stevens, where it's integrated. We have a great university here in, in right in Hoboken. We have the ability to have our students be integrated with, with their technologies and their learnings, and it's a shame that we're not leveraging that. Ms. rhodes Kearns. I happen to agree with Mr. Murray about the partnership with Stevens. As a matter of fact, our former superintendent was in talks with them um, for uh, the STEM program. They were the science, technology, engineering, math. And um, I don't know where those, as usual, where those discussions just stopped. But they're actually doing that in a school where I work at. It's a blue ribbon school. And um, so that's. I think it has to do with this revolving door, once again, with the administrators. And um, I did propose a plan for the next four years, but it was ignored by the kids' first majority. And I think these discussions need to happen, just like the discussions were supposed to happen with Ola and never transpired. And um, so kids first chased Ola away for being a district program, and now Ola is doing what they promised. So we need programs like that. 
we could tie, uh, tap into the hospitality trade in our town also. Time. Any rebuttals in this section? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next question. I guess I'll do the order first, which is there. This will be Rose Kearns, Danziger, Bianca Mono, Waiters, Murray. Uh, and these, I have a couple questions here about uh, the, the racial diversity and charter school issue. I think most of us know what the issue is about. S some of the questions are kind of, rather than read leading questions of one way or another way about the issue, I think I'll just present it as that. Your comments on the issue of diversity and charter schools, say whatever you'd like to say. We'll begin with Mo Ms. Rhodes Kearns. Um, in Hoboken, um, I believe it goes by the uh, community, the reflection of what the community is. And, but I think we need to do more to reach out to those minority areas of town to get them to apply, to begin with, to these charter schools, to get that information out there. I think that's part of the, uh, the biggest problem. Just like with pre-K, trying to get the parents knowledgeable about that these programs are offered, that they can apply. And I think that would alleviate a lot of these um, issues that are going on. Ms. Danziger. Um, one of the charter schools has been um, um, has been told that they're um, segregated, and in my opinion, if segregation is an issue, then you should call the the justice department and let them address it as a civil rights issue, and it should not be something that taxpayers should pay to fight a lawsuit. Second thing is the school that my son goes to attempted to go to the Board of Education and ask the majority, kids first, if they could put information in the backpacks of every single pre-K-3 and pre-K-4 student to tell the parents about the three charter school choices and also to let them know that those schools are free, just like the public school. We were denied. So our school went actually to some of the uh, low-income um, areas, knocked on doors, brought with along with us Spanish-speaking uh, folks and to let them know that they can fill out an application for free and they can apply to the charter schools. Mr. Biancomano. I agree with Ms. R what uh, Ms. Rose Curran said. I think we do need to market our schools better, but in representing the, the public school board, it's, it's segregation effect is not something that I look at in charter schools, although I do feel that I represent all the taxpayers. Um, I can tell you that there, if there is segregation going on in our schools, we would address that as well, but it's something that I haven't really looked at, but I, for the charter school's sakes, yes, marketing is certainly something that uh, could be enhanced. Thank you. Ms. Waiters. When you start talking about race, it's a really sticky situation. It's an emotional issue. So I'm not gonna go with opinions, what I'm seeing coming in tonight. I'm going with facts. Let me just read this letter. Congratulations, we are happily to welcome your daughter, Deshauna Williams, into the Hoboken Charter School. So it's about involvement. There's a lot of minorities and people that's not fortunate and don't know, just don't simply know, like Ms. Lynn said, that they are welcome in the charter school. I made myself available, I entered the lottery, and my, my kids was welcome. So I didn't look at it as a segregated effect. What I looked at it as, everybody, I don't care who you are, should get, be given an opportunity to apply for the charter school. And being that there's so many little, uh, less fortunate, let's say, people that cannot, you know, go and like make themselves available. Since it's only 3%, let all of them go without the lottery. And then maybe, you know, it'll be equal because that's, you know, that's it in a nutshell. Okay, and Mr. Murray. There's three points I'd like to make about this, this uh, racial diversity divide. Uh, one is that my understanding is that the charter schools follow the state law in terms of how they uh, attract their students and retain their students. Uh, so they aren't really doing anything wrong. Second, uh, it's really that the dividing of this community has been a kid's first ploy to uh, take the focus off of the budget and the problems with, that we're having in the school with the budget right now. And it's disgusting to me the implication that the Hoboken public school children are somehow inferior because of uh, their racial makeup 
and not that there, the education is a, is a problem because of the incompetence of Ms. Stromwell's Kids First majority. That's really the sad part about this whole thing. It's not about, it's not about the charter schools. It's about the incompetence of the BOE board as it currently is, is held that, that's the problem. Any rebuttals on this? Okay, go ahead. Um, the, the Connor School now um, is somewhere between 88 and 95 percent um, uh, diverse African American um, low income. And to me, that is just as much segregation as you know what they're saying that the charter schools are doing. So I'd like to address both Peter and Fran and find out how we can allow this to happen in our community that all the children that are on a free and reduced lunch program can all end up in one school when that is the, the perfect example of not being able to help these children rise and, and become great citizens. Okay, so well, he addressed them directly, so whichever you guys want to go first, go ahead. When um, parents are applying to the school, as you know, you're a parent in the public schools, um, it's a courtesy many times that they extend to the parent to send their children to a school near where they live. As you know, geographically located, Connors is near the housing authority, and I grew up there. And that's why you do it. You have small children in clement weather, it's easy to get them to the location. When my children were in um, primary school, I chose Calabro because I lived in church towers. My, I worked, my mom would have to pick them up. It was a two block walk for her. So parents do that out of choice many times, and, and unfortunately that's what happened, with, I believe, with Congress. And that's how it began, and with many other schools like Wallace. A lot of the uptown people sent their children there for that reason too, the location. I must well, she, she addressed both of them, but then you can go after that. So go ahead. No, I absolutely agree with Fran. I think that uh, the location has uh, everything to do with where our schools are placed and, and, and so forth. But certainly this is the type of divisiveness that you know, we shouldn't even be discussing tonight in terms of Secretary of Defense. We should really just be moving forward on talking, discussing the real issues that are affecting our budget and things like that. So, but I certainly agree with Fran. So. I disagree. I totally disagree. I just said earlier, racial Segregation could be a sticky situation, so it's not to brush it under the rug, Peter. I must disagree with you with that. It should be addressed, okay? It's just as important as the business, the budget, and everything else, because this city received money from the state for them free and reduced lunch, 80% that's segregated into kindness. And what's more disturbing is to go down there and to say tonight that it, we have a choice, we don't have a choice. I have parents that came to me where their kids was forced out of Wallace and other public schools and deliberately put into Connors, okay? And I have documentation of everything and time stamp. So it is, a, it is a disheartening issue and it is kind of hard to discuss, but the facts is what it is. It's segregation and I'm gonna do something about it. It's time to have some minority on that board to help the other less fortunate people that don't have a voice. Thank you. Mr. Murray. You know, I think that we might all agree the fact that this isn't about the uh, segregation in the charter schools as much as it is about the segregation in the public in public schools and what we're able to do about that and why the, the current administration hasn't addressed that, but then they pointed the figure to other people. All right, let's go on to the next question. I'll hit the refresh button and voila. This will be Murray, Giancomano, Danziger, Rose Kearns, and the waiters. And this question reads, what's your stand on the fact that the BOE can raise the tax levy by 2% without public vote? And in fact, with the exemptions last year, they raised it by 3.9% without vote. Do you think the public's, public should have had the opportunity to vote on that? Mr. Murray. Well, the BOE raised the, uh, raised the taxes 3.9% this year on top of 4% the year before uh, without the public vote or public input. This system creates problems in that the BOE can freely spend the taxpayers' money without answering to the taxpayers. Again, 
We go back to the $2, 50% of our budget, half, one of every $2 goes to non-classroom activities, overhead. So do I think that the budget should be given back to the voters? Absolutely. Mr. Biancomano. I mentioned this earlier, I, was, I am adamantly against uh, raising taxes, even 1%, without having it to go to public referendum. My biggest reason why I voted against the budget the last two years, this all stemmed from a vote a few years ago, moving the elections from April to November. Many of my colleagues on the board said, oh, it would increase participation in November, which I'm all for. But at the same time, it eliminated what the public can do, uh, what the public can vote, uh, taking away the right for the public, excuse me, to vote on what to do with their money. And to me, that's the absolutely, uh, $38 million out of the $65 million budget comes from taxpayers. It's a lot of money for a district with a K-12 to enrollment of 1,700 students. K-12 to enrollment of 1,700 students. And um, I just, I adamantly believe that this, the budget should be on a ballot. I really do. Thank you. Ms. Danzig. There is not an organization, a business, a nonprofit that I know of that a group of people can write and vote on their budget without having to answer or get approval from somebody above them. I, I just, it's unfathomable to me, and it's a disgrace. And I think that it is time that if, if they're using my money, for educating my children, I should have a right to know how they're spending that money. And if I don't like how they're spending the money, I should have the, the, the opportunity to vote against it. And not only me, every single person in this room should have that vote. Ms. Rose Kearns. Obviously, we all are thinking alike when it comes to the vote on the budget that um, this citizens should have been allowed. That was taken away from them. I voted no for that move. I wanted it up to, there were three different ways I believe it could have been done. The legislators gave you uh, a choice. It could have been taken away by the board vote, by the municipality, or you could have put it to a public vote, and that's where it should have gone, to the public vote. And unfortunately, the Kids First Majority decided to take that right away from the public. So um, I agree it should be a public vote. Ms. Waiters. I agree with all the other candidates. Um, I was against it then, and I was a strong supporter and a big voice for that one. Um, it was like almost a little tricky tactic telling the people they're going to save billions of dollars in taxes by moving the election. And they snuck the referendum in there about moving the Board of Ed election giving themselves an extra year to serve, like shoving their service down our throat, and they threw that in there and took the right from the public. But they all raised their hand and said, we're gonna act under the authority of the people. That's not acting under the authority of the people. We didn't count then, and we didn't count when they changed the um, budget. But when I get on the board, that's one of the main things I'm gonna work on, is giving the rights to the public to vote on their budget. Any rebuttals? the magic button again. We will now go Waiters, Rose Kearns, Bianca Mano, Murray, and Danziger with the next question. And we've gotten a number of questions, at least four, and maybe some more in here, about superintendents, finding a superintendent, holding on to superintendents, etc. cetera. Uh, some of them have a little bit of a pejorative content in the cards, but I think you guys can just all comment on what, what would be uh, desirable in a superintendent, etc. cetera, uh, your theories on that, beginning with Ms. Waiters. Well, every superintendent that the kids first majority with their power and control mind stricken mentality that they have, just overlooked a good superintendent. Fran and Peter nominated for uh, the, super, the assistant superintendent to um, continue when the other superintendent left. Let me tell you what they did. On top of the money they already spent for lawsuits, they go outside and bring a new superintendent in and it, it, it seems kind of funny because every time right before an election we get a new superintendent that don't have a clue what's going on in our school and only counting his paycheck. And I'm down at Denver's every day, I'm down at the Board of Ed, this man is gone by lunchtime, okay? Yes, yes, Ms. Soboloff, okay, because you see me down there every day. 
And like I said, I'm a watchdog. And every superintendent know me. And closing it up, he said to me when I approached him his first day I was out there, he goes, oh, Dr. Toback told me about you, Pat Waiters. I said, yes. I mean, he said, Waters. I said, it's not Waters, it's Waiters. And yes, I will be at your office. Thank you. So that's how yeah. I feel about the superintendent. Right. Ms. Rose Kearns. Ms. Waiters is right. Uh, that is the plan that I proposed, was nominating our assistant superintendent to stop that revolving door. And um, six superintendents in seven years, eight business administrators in seven years. The word is out. The word is out to people who uh, are looking for jobs as superintendent. They don't want to apply to Hoboken because of the micromanagement that's been going on. The word is out. So uh, that's something that needs to be fixed. However, I still stand by my original plan. The assistant superintendent was in our district, uh, be mentored by our um, former superintendent. He was ready for the position. But um, again, now we're up to number six, looking for number seven. Mr. Bianca. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with Ms. Rose Kearns anymore. I was with her on that plan. I believe that Dr. Hernandez worked hard for three years. He was the assistant superintendent, three years, working under Dr. Toback, who many of my colleagues on the board thought was, was, was great and wonderful, and Dr. Toback thought Dr. Hernandez was great as well. And I just believe that, and, and the tricky part of it was, where we're just appointing an interim, which, would have gave Dr. Hernandez just a year to, or, or however long it took to either make him the permanent or pick a permanent, to give him a chance. I mean, I really think the morale of our, of our district in terms of our employees is low because they're seeing that instead of promoting from within, where they're going to these outside uh, 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 searches and things like that, and we literally have administrative turnover where the administrator barely gets to know where our buildings are before they leave. So we had somebody here for three years and, and I couldn't agree more with um, making him at least the interim superintendent. Thank you. Mr. Murray. I think that there's a fundamental difference in the view of the superintendent from uh, the kids first slate or the parents for progress slate and some of the other people here on the board. Uh, their position, and they could correct me if they were here, but they're not, is that the superintendent, is, they hire the superintendent and the superintendent runs the show, drop, you know, steers the car. That's great, except the board's role, which they don't believe, is to tell them where to drive to. So what we've had is we had two years of Razzalowski driving to the Bronx, and then two years of Carter driving from the Bronx to uh, Long Island, and then, you know, Brusak, somewhere in Brooklyn, and then Toback driving to Staten Island, and then Bronco coming back to Hoboken, and we've driven for seven years, and we're back to where we started, because we haven't set the direction and the time frame from the board, not from the superintendent. Ms. Danziger. This past interim um, superintendent was interviewed by the board for 35 minutes. They went into closed session, and they hired him. I'm an executive recruiter. I've been doing this for 17 years. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't hire an administrative assistant in 35 minutes. There is a very specific way that you go about hiring someone, and that is you pick an issue that is, that is, is strong and, and is, is, is um, a very, very important issue that's going on in the school. 48 hours before that person comes on an interview, you give them that issue. And when they show up for that interview 48 hours later, they have to have a plan, a strategy, and a launch plan to get that issue solved. If you give every single person that interviews for this job the exact same plan, at the end of it, you'll know who the right guy is for the job, or gal. All right, rebuttal. Ms. What? Okay, whatever. Okay. Rebuttal or comment, whatever you'd like to say, yes. No, I want to agree with that, but you had the three, year, the three years wrong. Um, Dr. Hernandez, even though Dr. Toback was here, he performed as the superintendent physically. So you 
said three years. What they said was Dr. Hernandez was the assistant superintendent. Yes, he was, but he did his job. I'm saying he did Dr. Tobek's job, what he was supposed to do. So that was a good nomination when you nominated well, him right, to be the superintendent versus looking on the outside. Oh, I see. Like, okay, that's her time. Did you? Okay, go ahead. I can't believe that the current board didn't have a contingency plan for the superintendent. Over a year ago, Dr. Tobak was interviewing for other jobs. So they had to know that this day would finally come. And then when he does walk away because he couldn't get more money, then you know, we're left with, this, with an interim superintendent and another wasted two years until we find somebody who might be permanent. It's very disappointing that the BOE does not take their oath seriously, and instead they want to micromanage and chase out the superintendents. Anyone else? All right. So next we will have Pressing the button, this will be Waiters, Murray, Biancamano, Dansker. I guess I had mispronounced your last name, sorry. And Robert Kearns. Uh, so, uh, Dansker? Yes. Okay. So, um, the next three questions are basically kind of the personal type of questions I was sort of talking about at the beginning. I kind of delayed them, but, but okay, do whatever you want. So, how have you contributed to the pr public school district prior to the election? Please give examples of service you have done for the district schools that you were particularly proud of. Please explain your role, what was ac uh, accomplished, and the benefit to the district. Do you have, third part, do you have children enrolled in the public schools, not charter schools, et cetera? So anyway, your own involvements in this town with education, Ms. Waiters. My actions speak louder than my words, and I appreciate I'm trying to save my voice for the city council meeting. Um, anyway, anyway, I'm at the school. Ms. P had my number, I guess, on speed dial, and every time there's a disciplinary issue or whatever, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Hoboken High, I'm working with Dr. Patrick Fitzhugh, I work on all the issues. So I, not one particular thing, anytime they need me, in the um, Board of Ed, in any other schools, I'm there. And I mean, I don't have all the documentations, but I document everything. I try to solve all the issues and like defuse stuff before it get like really blown out of hand. And I've been helping out a lot of parents that can't attend the meetings. I'm their voice, so I'm physically involved. Even when I lose the elections, they still call on pack waiters. So my actions speak louder than my words. Thank you. Mr. Murray. I've been involved in the Brandt PTO when my daughter was uh, in the pre-K program. Uh, I've also been uh, part of the PTO at Wallace. I've been part of the fundraising program there. Our family participates in many of the activities that, uh, from car washes to uh, movie nights. Uh, and uh, I'm also, I attend the board meetings and I do point out that there are real issues and that there are real problems. And in fact, at the last board meeting, I specifically pointed out that the goals that um, the board unanimously voted for the superintendent were you know, very short-sighted and weren't big enough picture to really get, the, to really address a lot of the challenges that we have in the, in the school district. So my job as watchdog, or to be able to point some problems out, continues. Thank you. Mr. Biancomano. I was a proud product of the early childhood program. I'm much younger, well I shouldn't say I'm just younger than uh, many of the uh, school board members that I uh, sit with. And I just wanted to give back to my community. The community has given so, so much to me. And my last three and a half years on the board, I think I've been an advocate for people. I think when my phone rings, I answer them. I speak to everybody respectfully, even though sometimes they might have a disagreement with me. And I think I put in a lot of work for an unpaid position. So, and I just look forward to continuing to that because many times uh, people's voices aren't heard and I like to be uh, the person that could assist those voiceless people out there. Thank you. Ms. Dansker. My son goes to one of the charter schools and I have sat on many committees um, within the charter school to help um, build some of the curriculum, to do some of the fundraising, and worked with many, many folks within the organization and outreach to the community. Um, what I've done in the, the past several months is a lot of work behind the scenes that maybe you don't see, but I've met with um, past uh, 
superintendents, I've sat with students, I've talked with teachers, I've talked to other administrators in the community, knowing that I wanted to learn what was going on in this community, in our schools, from the inside out and not from the outside in. And I will continue to do that, and I will continue to do that when I'm a board member because I believe that we all can sit up on the dais and make decisions. And whether our kids go to Wallace or they go to Brant, we can't possibly know everything that's going on in all the schools. And the only way to do that is to have open communication. Ms. rhodes Kearns. Uh, many of you may not know, but I did have two children who attended the Hoboken Public Schools. Um, of course, they're long gone from there. But, um, I was very involved. Our PTO in Brandt, as a matter of fact, would win awards. And on the board level, I am the legislative delegate. I go to Trenton on Saturdays on a regular basis. And I'm also on the NJSBA Special Education Committee, and um, where we keep an eye on bills that are coming down the pike in Trenton. And because sometimes they come with unintended consequences for the district. So to alert everybody and um, get the board members involved, letting them know to contact the legislators and whether like, give their opinion or ask them not to vote in a certain way or to vote in a certain way. So, and I'm also an advocate for thinking out of the box, just like I did with the older district program. I was hoping it would come into our district, but um, unfortunately it didn't. 